Good morning, Keith. Good morning, Mitch. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. How about yourself? Man, I'm rocking today. <laughs> Me too. I got some good sleep past couple days, so like I am feeling good. I'm feeling good too. I got some new in- insoles for my my shoes. Oh, you got a little pep in your stuff. Yeah, I do. I, I like it. Nice. I like it when well, you get extra a arch support. Yeah, I need to get mm. some insoles for it's these. It's good for me. Dr. Scholl's, not a sponsor, but uh, that's the brand I'm using. Nice. Nice. So today we're going to we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, some different stuff and really um, focusing on how, um, how to connect with and build up uh, like the next generation – like mm. your kids, you know? Yeah, talk about pouring into folks and then uh, grace and truth. Uh, and we want to use, want to frame it up around the story of the prodigal son. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, for folks not familiar with the prodigal son, you want to give the, uh, like, the condensed... Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the prodigal son, so basically there's a, a father... Uh, who's, you know, you can think of a landowner, a farmer, right? It's got a lot of land, got a lot of people working for him. Um, you know, kids are, kids are, got a couple sons, you know? Kids are like, hey, when's my, when's my dad going to kick the bucket so I can have my money, right? Well, one of the kids, um, you know, is kind of like that. And, and his, his father's like, well, here you go. You want it now? Here you go. Basically gives him his, his half of his inheritance, right? So the kid goes... Kid goes off and spends it lavishly doing all sorts of debauchery and inappropriate things. Um, then realizes, you know, after a period of time, I would assume years later, uh, spends all of his money and is like, oh, now I don't have any money. What What can I, what should I do? Uh, and then realizes, you know what, I'm just going to go back, beg my dad for forgiveness and ask to be one of his his farmhands, one yeah. of his workers, right? Um, you give, know, give me a part-time minimum wage job. Please. Yeah, give me, you know, just so I can, you know, get back on my feet. I, I you know, hopefully he'll accept me. He comes back, um, doesn't even have to do anything. His dad just sees him coming up the road and runs to him, and you know, like basically, uh, you know, gives him gives him a ring, you know, showing that he's part of the family again, and and just treats him like he never left. Has a big, has a big, uh, you know, feast and party that uh, his son came back. Great story, love it. Lots of layers, D- tons of layers, lots of layers. Some would call it an onion of a story. <laughs> um, so, so obviously the 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 big, um, you know, you think about passion and or uh, compassion and forgiveness and um, you know fatherly love, right? Really, you know, it's kind of a an allegory yeah. for. Um, you know, and this is a parable that uh, Jesus uh, shared. Mm-hmm. So, um, so quick though, let's start with um, let's break the ice with talking about like underappreciating things or things that we've grown to um, lose the appreciation of. Yeah, uh, real quick, I got a, yeah. I I just I am full. I've lists and lists and lists of things that like are phenomenal and then you just start taking them for granted uh like you or people in general no i can think of some so because you seem like a very grateful person oh i am you're very appreciative very um so every like if you've ever like um like tools Mm, mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. um and you if you think about like the progression of tools and construction stuff like yeah. that. Like, have you ever been, like, um, like you had a handsaw, like you to show- a, a mechanical yeah, saw. Yeah, like, uh, now we have sixteen different kinds of saws. Yeah, like you ever gotten into something like really, like really old? You're like rehabbing something real or anyway, and it's flat head screws, mm. right? Mm-hmm. The most frustrating mm-hmm. mechanical fastener of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're like, man, that Phillips guy. <laughs> that came out yeah. with the the Phillips oh, yeah. head was like a Get genius. You so much more. Grip. Oh man, and like revolutionized the world. Mm-hmm. And then we, and then there in like the nineties, we just scrapped that for the square head. Yeah, because like that didn't. That was like mm-hmm. that was it. And then you had like a mechanical mechanical drill, like a mechanical drill motor mm-hmm. that could like spin mm-hmm. the Phillips head or the square head. All fascinating. And then boom, it's on to star heads. And then yeah, hex and then and, yep. 
And then and you- now they have specialized, like, uh, and actually this is kind of interesting. Um, so there's a law going through Congress, I'm pretty sure. I don't think it's passed to yet. To outlaw flathead. Where, uh, no, no, to outlaw companies using proprietary screws. So you have to take it. To, it mainly happens in electronics. Oh, right. Where they use proprietary heads on the yep. screws so that you have to bring it to them for service. You can't service it yourself. So there's a, uh, and I won't name the name of the company that's most famous for doing it. Well, they're not a sponsor anyway. They're not a, sp- a sponsor, but there's a giant company that's very famous for doing this. Um, and, um, so they're they're gonna out they're gonna basically say that if you've got uh, a, a proprietary screw or something like that for some reason you have to open source the you tool. You have to open source the tool um, to be able to repair it, which I think is a great use I of think our government's time. Very that is an American thing. Yeah, very American. Very American. I need to be allowed the opportunity to, to fix it myself or break it so no one else <laughs> can break it. Break it further than take it to a real person will charge me double because I broke it. That's but that is my. Prerogative. That is my God given right. My Americanness <laughs> is allowed to screw something up <laughs> further either, than it already was. Either fix it or screw it up so bad nobody else can. That's right. That is that's right. <laughs> so I I I there are two things that I always think about um that we're accustomed to not only electricity. Well, I I hold wait for a moment. Running water. Uh I'm just gonna say air conditioning. Because electricity is nice. I mean, it's really nice. But like air conditioning, we, we're so accustomed to it that we don't we don't even know. Like we, we could not. I mean, it's what? 80 something degrees outside right now. We probably couldn't be in this room right now doing this. We, we'd have to have the windows and the doors open. It'd probably be 85 in here. And probably our electronic equipment wouldn't be functioning exactly properly. We, we probably have to go outside and do this podcast right now and i don't know that our equipment would function exactly it would our even- air conditioning is like without without air conditioning you can't have computers you can't have servers you can't have i mean think of all the things that air conditioning helps us with right that's number one number two the ability to not be sick like to breathe you know you you miss it when you got oh, your allergies man. or when you got the flu, right? You, you'll do any. Oh, my God. I got the flu. I'll do anything to feel good right now. But when you feel, feel good, good, you're just accustomed to it. And you don't. You don't. So every now and then I have to think to myself, <sighs> I can breathe today. It's amazing. That's good. Yeah. So. Air fryer. Do you have an air fryer key? I do have an air fryer. Okay. I'm not all about. Adding <clears throat> kitchen appliances, yeah. right? Like, okay. Like tools. Like you don't have like three different kinds of graters in case you want to do a fine shred or a loose shred. No, I got the you one that turns. You get the, the little turns. square one. The you get the turns, little square yeah. one. The different yeah. sizes, yeah. right? Like I, I, I want to be uh, strategic. You have 12 different simple. kinds of pans depending on what size. I got of... mainly two I use. I have a skillet and a saucepan. Those a are saucepan, my- saucepan, that's it. I like to use those for okay. everything. Um I have one knife. You have a grilling tongs and a cooking tongs? I do because one's nylon coated and right. the other's stainless. No. Yep. Um, okay. So it sounds like you have a lot of utensils. I, I, do, I just try to keep it minimized. So anyway, this sure. whole air fryer thing comes along, this rage, mm-hmm, right? And mm-hmm. I was like, no. Yeah, me too. You know, like, no. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I end up with one, and Keith, like, it's one of those underappreciated things. Like, when the air fryer's yeah. dirty, right? Like, you made some late-night pizza rolls. <laughs> I love me some pizza and rolls. Then, and then, you know, you didn't clean it because yeah. you didn't clean it. Mm-hmm. And then the next day, it's time for chicken nuggets, and yeah. you're like, no, the air fryer's dirty. Oh, Like, mm-hmm. whatever will we do, right? Like, the sky is falling, the world is ending. Really? For the next day? Maybe I'll just go buy a secondary air fryer. Maybe I need two. Yeah, or right. a second basket or something. Do you have a you have do you have a basket for it? So no, we have a we have a. It looks like a toaster oven, and you know the thing comes down or you know the, the yeah yeah the, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah it's got a basket in it, so it's easy to just pull that basket, hose it off in the sink real fast if you well, forget. So I, it's the tray though underneath that gets disgusting. I got the one that you you can, you can shake it. 
Oh, you've got like a tray, like, a, pulls, tra- like yeah, a yeah, like yeah, a yeah, yeah. like a cabinet or something. Kind yeah, of, yeah, pulls style. like the drawer uh-huh. pulls out the drawer. Yep, yep. And it has so you, yeah. Those we had one of those at first, and we did that. We cooked something in it, and we forgot about it for like a week. Yeah, bad deal. Just had to toss the whole thing. Mm. You didn't get one like I've got. It's got a, like a tray that just you know it's got like a wire. It's like a metal wire basket in there that you can just. It's got better surface and everything. But but I can't shake it. You <laughs> like to shake nuggets, you know? <laughs> shake shake them nugs. Yeah. I did not use the air fryer last night when I made dino chicken nuggets for the kids you for didn't? dinner. I, did I can not. tell. You showed me a picture I and used they the oven. looked un um uncrisp. They were they were definitely not as crisp had I used the air fryer, but I um I wanted to use the rest of the bag, you know, because like you don't want to leave five dino chicken nuggets in a bag. Right? No, 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 no. So you just got to do them all. Yes. And it was more than the air fryer could handle. So I tossed them in the oven. And, you know, I mean, I think I used last night um, one, two, three, three, four pans to cook mac and cheese, dino chicken nuggets, and peas. Most impressive. But, you know, I'm a purist. <laughs> use, use more pans than the actual product you're producing. That's a true purist. Well, see, I would have, I would have um, boiled as little water as possible for my macaroni noodles. All right, and then dropped my wire steamer basket down on top of it after I put the noodles in and <laughs> dumped steam the, the peas, dump in. The peas yeah. in. Boom! Yeah. And then you dump all of that through the same. Well, you don't even dump it through a strainer. You just turn it upside down with the lid, strain it yeah. into the sink, add your cheese. Boom! Yeah. Underappreciated. Underappreciated. Um, yeah, there. I mean, I even think uh, talking about dinner last night. Uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but like mac and cheese and peas, right, was a staple growing up, and like you you got so accustomed to it. I haven't had it in forever. We had it last night with the Dino chicken nuggets, and uh, that was it was delicious. Yeah, I think I've always felt mac and cheese to be an interesting thing. We've had this conversation before. We'll waste more podcast time on it. Um, Keith, you're a mac and cheese guy. You make phenomenal mac and cheese. I make it, it's okay great. I just cheese. don't care about mac and cheese anymore, ever. I had a, I had my... You ever just have your limit? Yeah. I did by age 12, and I'm done with yeah, it. Yeah, fish sticks is mine. Mm. I had so much by probably 12 or 13. I can't even, I can't even stand the smell of them. It's just like, I can't do it. Just, you know, my dad had us on... Uh, my mom worked late on Thursday nights, and uh, so my dad had us, and the only thing he could make was uh, fish sticks and peas and mac and cheese, which so we'd have that, uh, or goulash, which I love, That's and cool. I still love. I'm about, I think I just threw up my mouth a little bit. Because of goulash? And it tastes like goulash, so mm. that's good. I just had the full- It's like the Midwestern goulash, though. It's just like elbow noodles, ground beef, and like, you know, a can of- uh, tomato, you and know, then, yeah, they never tomatoes. drain the noodles, right. It's all yeah. full of water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, sorry for all the listeners we just lost. So <laughs> it's delicious. Um, all right, let's talk about Jesus. So let's talk about let's talk about this story real fast. Um, what, what I find fascinating a little bit about this story is could you imagine? And I'm sure there's there's tons of people out there that are like this, but can you imagine like your whole life, you're just waiting for your parent to die to get your inheritance? It's horrible. It's terrible. It's, I mean, this, this story is so intriguingly terrible in the beginning, right? Because it's like, imagine, and then imagine having the, not, not necessarily the audacity, but to like verbalize that. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, one of my dad's favorite phrases, like, you know, if you have a good relationship with your father, it's uh, you get to the point where you know you guys you guys poke at each other. You know, yeah, you know, it's yeah, a, it's a sure you know, good relationship stuff. And anyway, you ever if you uh, if you you know ribbed ribbed old dad a little bit, you know, like maybe something to cut for real, he'd say. You're gonna miss me when I'm gone, you know, and that's <laughs> yeah. one of his phrases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna, you're gonna miss me when I'm gone. Yeah, and, uh, and then you're like, oh, don't say that. <laughs> don't, don't say that. Don't, stop. don't stop. say that. He broke that out, you know. <laughs> um, 
But, um, you know, one of the things I think about um, with this story and why I think about with the father in this story and the father, you know, agrees and gives, you know, splits inheritance and sends off, sends off the kid. Um, one allows him to, to, I mean, allows him, yeah. allows him to just take the inheritance and yeah, leave, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Go Versus putting a stipulation on the inheritance, yeah. like, sure, you can have it now, but you got to stay in the family business, right? Yeah. Or like whatever, yeah. you know. And what, what I was, I was thinking about this, and yeah, you know, we usually we like tell our kids and um, to um, to like learn from others' mistakes, mm. right? But you can't actually do that. Oh, I, I'm going to disagree with Hold you. Hold on. I'm going to disagree You can't you. live your life like that. Because you don't, because if all you, you do yeah, is okay. learn sure. from others' mistakes, you don't sure. even have a life. You just have, you're watching, you're watching life unfold around you that others are having. Sure. Right? Because you are a culmination of your successes and your failures. That is who you are. Yeah, but and, you, you can not make the same failures other people around you have made. You, you can be aware of... But you can also so overcorrect. We tell our, we tell our middle direction. child this all the time about our older child, right? Because you yeah. know, our our older kid is going to be the first to make X mistake, yeah, like whatever it is, right? Um, and so you know, we we tell the middle child all the time, "Hey, you see that? Yeah, see how she got in trouble? Yeah, learn from her mistake. Yeah, but she will. But she'll make her own mistake. That you'll but don't turn make around. the same mistake that your sister made a but, year from now. But you'll turn around to the older one and be like, "Now see that overcorrected." Don't go that direction. No. <laughs> or, or if she makes the same mistake, you look at the older one and go, look, see, you taught her that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I that's I think I think the father um I think the father is very wise in this. I think um you know, like um recognizes um it is age that um and wisdom that that this doing this is the only course of action right the son won't have any appreciation in anything unless the father's actually teaching him so much by allowing him this freedom to go do this he rec- recognized this is his only fatherly course of action is is well, to allow him to do that. Yeah, for multi for a multitude of reasons, right? Um, you don't want, you know, a, one of my fears in life a little bit is being so strict or st- stringent with my kids that they don't want to have anything to do with me mm-hmm. when they're older, right? Like, and and part of that is to your point. Sometimes you have to let them do something that you know is going to turn out terrible. Yeah. Because stopping them will actually hurt them further, right? In your relationship with them further than just letting them do it, right? It's kind of like um, uh, you, you, both your kids are into sports. They're they're good at sports, which is great. Uh, one of my kids is not, but she constantly wants to do sports. So it's like, you know, okay, okay, okay. You know, even though you know it's not going to end up well, um you, you, she has to go through the experience. She has to learn from that experience, you know? Um, and, you know, so sometimes you, you have to say yes, even though you're like, you know, it's taxing for you, right? You got to take them places and practice and games and be supportive and this and that. Um, you know, it's kind of your point, right? Like you get to a point where you're just like, okay, you know, I'll be supportive of, of your decision. Go for it, you know? It's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, this this I, 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 as an aside question is 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 the is the ideology behind inheritance is it dying? Like, what do you mean? Like, I I would you know f- phrasing it as like um, you know really like your your le- your legacy right like okay. your legacy as a human being. Uh, mine are obviously my children. You know, like. But I also want to leave something to them, right? Like to them or to the world. Um, to well, I'm I'm, I'm leaving something to the world right now. That's on this right. Podcast, so. Digital, 
check off the list. Okay? Yeah. But I, you know, I want to like, I, I don't, uh, you know, I want to leave something to my kids and we're very, an, an in experiential, uh, generation. So like, you know, like me and my wife are both like, you know, if, if I were to, if I were to pass, you know, I want the kids to go take their families on a trip, you know, paid for with some inheritance. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Like, yeah. You know, like I, I don't want to leave them $20 million, but like, you know, but you set, you're setting up, you're building a, you're building a family um, value of shared experiences yeah. of taking a trip. Yeah, exactly. So then you're building that into your nuclear family. Yes, exactly. So then you would like that to be carried on to the next generation, which right. actually is what makes it a tradition, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Passes from one sure. generation to the next. Sure. So spanning generations. Yeah. And I, you think, would like, I think inheritance is a little bit like that. You know, like if you think about, if you think about, the way the society worked back back then, and then up until probably you know the early 1900s, you had this idea of the work that you put in to life. You're leaving that legacy to your children to continue that work, making each generation a little bit better mm-hmm. than the previous generation was. Right from a from a family aspect, um, and I, I just have the feeling that this is like I, I know more people my age or older that have the mentality of, you know, like, like how can I spend all my money before I'm gone? Like, you know, like this mentality of they're working. I started, you know, I started from nothing. I worked and I earned all of this and man, if I can spend it all, that's great. Right. Like this, this uh, mentality of just working your whole life, you know, working 50 mm. years, 60 years to enjoy 10 or 20 years mm. uh, is 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 different to me. Do you, do you feel the same way? I'm not sure I understand. Okay, I'm, Siri. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> no. Um, I think there's all sorts of layers in that one. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's a podcast the, for another It day. is. There's... Uh, you know, because I think you're getting into generational studies of different generations mm-hmm. and how different generations are shaped by the circumstances of the world they're in. So we're ta- very very much talking about American generations. Yeah. Um, and those different American generations, um, you know, the different generations experienced life differently and they're products of a world shaped by generations before them. And then get transformed. Those generations get transformed, and then you have some generations that have less influence mm-hmm. on the world, their impact on the world they're living in, mm-hmm. and some have more. And I think maybe you're talking about um, maybe a generation that feels like their own personal experience is where they have some control, versus impacting um, this country on a larger scale. Interesting. And, and creating change and stuff like that. Yeah, I just think that um, some of the story gets lost in maybe some of the current generation in terms of like this inheritance could be um, hundreds of years old. Mm, okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Like some of this inheritance is like from the father's 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 father. Like mm. this, this could be like this huge family... Um, and you know, I don't want to say enterprise, right? But like, you know, imagine you've got uh, a a billionaire who leaves his, you know, like I'm retiring, son. Here you go. Versus I'm retiring, <laughs> son. You're not in charge. This other person's going to be in charge, right? Like, and how much of a scandal that that is, right? In our minds, um, I think some of that gets lost in this, right? Like inheritance almost to us thinks like, well, the money that I made throughout my lifetime, mm. but it's really like this, talking about this generational wealth, huge generational wealth, right? Um, so, anyways, I, I just thought that I thought that was a fascinating as an aside. But um, what I think is even uh, more um, interesting in connection with this story is really the reaction of the father when the son comes back, right? Yeah, now we're getting into the meat of it. So his reaction when they come back is not of, oh, let me stand here, wait for my son to walk all the way down this road to see what he has to say. It was 
him running out to mm-hmm. meet his son, right? Which means that he was watching for him. Yep. It's right? amazing. Um, and then to not even not even care what happened, like the you know, like where where where's all you know, where's your where's your money? Why are you dressed like this? You know, like what yeah. no, just just hey, look, come on, let's have a party. As You're, you are come on, as you are, right? Um and so really like there's two bits there that I think are important. One, you can tell this father has a great relationship with his son because when his son blew all the money, didn't say, well, the last place I'm going is back to my dad's place, right? Because yep. I'll never hear the end of it, yep. right? He, that's the first place he thought of going. So it's that safe, it's that safe. Oh, nice. Yeah. Home that he knows that he can always come back to. And a that, safe base. A safe base, right? And the fact that the father even um, gives you more information on on how secure that base is uh, by um, just immediately not even caring and, ex- and accepting him back just like nothing ever happened. Full of grace. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's really like, for me, um, and we've we've talked about this before with our kids, and that's, that's what I mean by like before of like, I don't want my kids to never want to hang out with me, mm-hmm. right? I don't want them to. I don't want them to feel like they can't do anything in life without talking to me. But I want them to have that secure base to know that if they've got troubles in life, they can come back to to yep. my wife and myself, right? Like they can come back to us, and 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 we'll help them in whatever situation that they're in. They don't, yeah. Even if they ask to go to be. Completely independent. With half of your money. With half of your money. <laughs> could you could you could you imagine one of your kids being like, Dad, I'm gonna need half of your bank account. <laughs> We're gonna need- I'm going out. I'm We're going out on I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> so really I, I think that um for me, I, I'm not sure that that concept of not just you're not just in charge of raising your kids and teaching them right and wrong, and then 18, you know, you're the old adage, you're like, when you turn 18, you're, uh, you're out of the house, you're on your own, right? Well, that's not necessarily true, right? Like, that's one method, I guess, is I'm going to feed you, clothe you, and put a roof over your house, and then when you're 18, see ya. Um, but really, the idea is all that plus giving them that firm base that they know that they're supported in life even when they're not at the house. So I'm agreeing with all this and I want to take it this step further because I think as Christians, we're called to model this and be this and create a safe, secure base um, of truth to speak truth into folks, uh, kids, youth, youngsters, give them, um, opportunities to succeed and fail on their own and be there to pick up the pieces uh, and um, support them through that um, and give them a place to return to. And I think that's kind of what we're called to as the church, but it's not a building, right? It's yeah. the, the kids aren't going to come back um, to a church building. They're going to come back to relationships and experiences and, um, You know, that's something I think about is sometimes we get too wrapped up with you and I at our age with children, um, spending all this um, supportive energy on our own children, but we also need to spread it out over Mm. um, this next generation. Um, Like, um, I need to be a supportive, caring voice of reason, of truth, and also of grace with your kids. Sure. And you with mine. Yeah. Um, and kind of foster those relationships so um, we can be reassuring um, adults in a kid's life. So, like, if someday one of my kids comes to you and is like, man, Keith, I cannot, I got a problem and I can't go to dad with this. Mm-hmm. You can be reassuring, like, yeah, you can. Sure. Um, you, you know, and, um, and all those relationships don't get started with like a, like, big mon, they don't, they don't open up with big monumental issues like that. Mm-hmm. It's all small stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, how many times have I opened Parker's applesauce, right? Like he knows 
Right. He knows I'm capable of helping him with something and he can ask me for help. Sure. If he's like um, if if I'm doing something in another in another room or something and he can't find me, he he there's a there's a secure base yeah, of Mitch, people that he's like Mitch, Mitch where's Dad? Where's Dad? Yeah. You know. And yeah. I think, you know, that's at a very small level, but um hopefully that continues. Um and we can be that voice for other um or that sounding board or that um help build that secure base for others, um, for children and youth as part of this community, as part of this church. Yeah. I, uh, and I know we're, we're running out of time. I mean, I just want to kind of, um, I want, I want to agree with that, uh, to, to the 10th degree. And I think that, uh, a lot of people in, in today's world, uh, and I was reading, I was reading something, and I forget what I was reading about, but there was like a comment section on the article, right? In the comment section, somebody was like, you know, said, "Oh, could you imagine at sixteen or eighteen talking to somebody in their thirties? They're like, that's so weird." And I'm like, "What's weird about that? When I was sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, I had no problem talking to the neighbor who was mm-hmm. in their fifties." We had a great relationship. Years later, twenty five years later, we had we had a, a problem. The one of the first people I went to that neighborhood was having some issues. And uh, anyway, like I I don't I find it I find it weird to that a a fifteen sixteen seventeen or eighteen year old child teenager. Mm-hmm can't talk to somebody in their 30s well i think but, but i think it's to you it's your point is they've only experienced their fam, like their parents or their yeah. grandparents and they haven't had that they haven't had that base of other reasonable adults that can help support them and show them the love and some attention and some care um that then they they learn that it's okay to I mean, to interact with people that aren't your age. Like it's, it was a weird concept. It is. And a lot of people were agreeing with them. And I'm like, where's this coming from? I think the, I think one layer that makes that a little more complicated is when you and I were growing up, um, verbal communication was communication. Oh, interesting. So therefore it yeah. was modeled by our parents. Sure. We watched it. We were part of it. We grew up in a world where we watched our adults have adult conversation, mm-hmm. you know, have conversations with other adults. Um, they would either exclude or include us in that conversation. We learned that etiquette mm-hmm. of, you know, standing nearby and then it'd be like, hey, do you have a thought or opinion? Right? We would be brought into the conversation. We'd be like, hey, go over there and kick that ball. Yeah. Right? right. Like you're in or out of the conversation, but you witnessed um, face-to-face verbal communication through from more adults. Uh, and then you had a more of a propensity to think that's how I have to adapt and interact in this world because that's how it's done. Well, now I think more pertinent question is how many, how many of our youth feel like uh, they could reach out and text an adult? That's the more the comparable. I think there's a there's a there's a disconnect in because our generations, uh, we grew up in a world uh, learning verbal, learning a lot of our verbal communication and dialogue um, with folks older than us. Mm. Um, yeah, but see the thing, like if 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 your if your parents are on their phones and they're texting all the time. You don't you don't see that community. You just exactly. see a text. You don't see the exactly. you don't see the conversation that's yes. happening. Yes, you're not witnessing how right. you're not wi- witnessing okay. the etiquette of how to do it. Sure. So so you're 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 learning with your peer to group. your peer group and learning that etiquette. and then and then it's so wildly different. Uh, you know, like the the phrases and words yeah. that you know, teenagers use today versus what, you know, mid thirties would use. Right. We are old. We are old. old. I'm not even mid thirties. I'm, I'm older than that. But, uh, the, the, the language that we use is so wildly different that when that teenager interacts with somebody in their thirties, their language is so, again, they've never heard that language and they've never heard it modeled kind of to your point. Interesting. I have to think about that more. I just, I, I just find that um, I think there's a larger. I think there could be a larger gap today in how, um, how we're teaching our youth to interact with others because some of it, to your point, isn't 
they're not exposed to the the full spectrum of it. Interesting. And mm-hmm. then we expect, and then we expect a generation that um, has so much nonverbal communication, so much um, about pictographs, yeah, like mm-hmm. so much nonverbal communication to to just sit down and talk with us. <laughs> well, right? Like, well, that's actually just weird. Like, so we need to drop that expectation yeah. of you either need to double down, double on, down. on the I'm amount double downer. on the amount of um verbal communication you have and the questions you ask and how much time you spend listening. Mm. So just double down, triple down on your listening before you expect um this next generation just come talk to you. Interesting. That's my hot take. Hot take. So that's it. We went we went way over. People probably tuned out by now. Yeah. We'll you edit it. Yeah, we'll edit it out. You still haven't used a salt block, have you? Tune in next next week to see if Mitch has actually used his block of salt. I will. I will. I'll do it. <laughs>